Welcome to today's program. My name is Rick Renner and I've been waiting for you. I can nearly see you sitting right there. And I'm going to say thank you for letting me come into your space. I know you have a lot of things you could be doing. And thank you for making time to be with me as you and I return today to James chapter 5. I'm teaching a brand new series, which is called Getting the Basics Right. It's five parts and it comes in multiple formats. I love this particular series because it just covers so many basics that we need to get right in our lives. The subtitle says, Biblical Guidelines for Money, Relationships, Prayer, and Dealing with Wayward Believers, Friends, or Loved Ones. It is just a marvelous series. I've devoured it as I've taught it, and I pray that you've enjoyed it. If you haven't seen the previous programs, either go back to the archive and see them or order the series. And as always, it comes with a study guide that is filled with everything that is in the programs. And the reason we do this is because we understand that when you read it while you hear it or see it, it helps you to really reinforce the teaching down deep inside you. And we know you want to get the teaching of God's Word down deep inside you. But you can order these by going online or by giving us a call right now. And we're also offering you this week my book, which is called Signs, you'll see just before Jesus comes. He is coming. The back of the book says, Jesus thinks signs are important. That's why he gave us clear markers in Matthew 24 that would indicate his soon return. The signs on the road are appearing closer together. We're on the precipice of something new. Soon we'll see the final sign at the edge of our destination in the very last moments just before Jesus comes. And this entire book is filled with the signs you'll see just before Jesus comes. You will devour it. And please remember that when you become a partner with our ministry, and a partner is anyone who regularly financially supports our ministry, and when we call you a partner, we really use that word very carefully. We really mean you're a partner because together with you and with us, together, we're taking the teaching of the Bible to people all over the planet in fulfillment of Jesus' command in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, where he said, go into all the world and teach all nations. That is our mandate from heaven, mine and yours. We're all commanded to be a part of the Great Commission. And when you become a partner, you help us take the teaching of the Word of God to people everywhere. And the moment you become a part of our partner family, we're going to send you my book, which is called Life in the Combat Zone, and Denise's book called The Gift of Forgiveness. We send these two books to everyone who becomes a part of our partner family. And please remember that if you need prayer, we're waiting for the phone to ring this very moment. Just ring us right now or send us an email. And the moment the phone rings or the moment your email shows up in our inbox, we're going to begin to pray for God to do something tremendous in your life. And he really will. But I'll be back in just a moment. Stay tuned for a teaching you can trust, a message that will inspire, strengthen, and equip you with vital insights and understanding from the Word of God. Here is Rick. We've already seen in these programs that James is writing to a group of believers that are really suffering. Their problem is identified in James chapter 1, verse 1, where he describes his readers as those that have been scattered abroad which is a translation of the Greek word diaspora. The word diaspora describes a particular kind of planting of seed. There were two ways to plant seed. You could methodically plant one seed in a nice, neat, orderly row, one after another. That's not the word that James uses. He uses the word diaspora, which means scattered abroad. This is the second method of planting seed. When you put your hand into a satchel of seed and just grabbed a whole handful and then just randomly with no rhyme or reason, just begin to scatter it all over the field. That is the word that is used in James chapter one, verse one. And it tells us that the believers he is addressing who are Jewish believers, they have been ripped out of their homes like seeds scattered abroad. They've been scattered all over the eastern lands of the Mediterranean Sea. They've lost their homes. 
They've lost their businesses. They've lost their finances. They can't even find all of their family members because they were so abruptly scattered abroad due to persecution. And the persecution began in Acts chapter 8. And now Pastor James is getting letters from these Jewish believers all over those lands, and they're expressing to him their frustrations, their struggles. They feel like their lives are being crushed and destroyed. When you come to chapter 5, you find that whereas before they were business owners and they were prosperous, now they're seeking employment and getting very low-level paying jobs, and they are so frustrated, and they're wondering, when is all of this going to change? And by the way, when is Jesus ever going to come? And they're also thinking about just giving up or possibly just taking matters into their own hands to fix things by themselves. They're just experiencing a lot of frustration. And many believers experience frustration in their life because of spiritual attacks or because they're waiting for something to happen. Just frustration on so many different levels. And that's what these believers were experiencing. So when you come to James chapter 5 and reach for your Bible, we always use the Bible in this program, James says to these struggling believers in James chapter 5 verse 10, Take my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and patience. But when you read this in the Greek text, it's a little bit different. At the very first of the verse, it uses the Greek word hupodegma, which would be better translated, take for an example. The word hupodegma was used to picture a student who's learning to copy the letters of the alphabet. I remember when I was learning to write. My teacher would give me the alphabet, and I could see how she had beautifully written every letter of the alphabet. And I would sit with my pencil and my pad of paper, and I would try to copy those letters, every little curl, every little swirl. I would diligently try to copy every single letter. That is the word that is used here. And here James says, when you're going through a rough time, it would be very good for you to remember how those who have been through hard times in the past how they did it, and how they did it well, and copy what they did. Study them. Study how they forgave. Study how they stayed in faith. Study them and copy them. Take them as an example. And he says, my brethren. Again, we come to the word brethren, which appears over and over and over in the book of James, the Greek word adelphos, from delphos, which is the word for the womb of a woman. But you put an A on the front. It's two or more born out of a womb of a woman. Hence, it describes brothers or sisters, but it was used in a military sense to describe comrades in a fight or soldiers that were faithfully slugging it out together. So it carries the idea of camaraderie or brotherhood. And again, we find that James crawls into the trenches and looks into the eyes of these Christian fighters eyeball to eyeball, and he begins to address them. And he says, take my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example. Here's what you should copy of the way that they dealt with suffering, affliction, and of patience. Suffering, affliction is a compound word, kako, patheo. The word kakos and the word pathos. The word kakos depicts something that is foul. The word pathos usually describes a suffering connected to the mind or to the emotions. But when you put the two words together, it means to put up with a lot mentally and emotionally or to be emotionally and mentally tough. And here he says, the prophets of the past, they had to put up with a lot and they had to be mentally tough. And he said, patience. The word patience here is so very important. You'll see why in just a moment. Then he goes on and in verse 11, he says, Behold, we count them happy which endure. And the word behold is the Greek word edu. It carries a sense of wonderment. Wow, look at this. Look what happens to those who endure. And he says, we count them happy. Makarizo is the Greek word. It literally means to count supremely blessed, happy and blessed with all kinds of benefits. Why? Because they didn't give up. They endured all the way to the end. And when you endure all the way to the end and press through everything you're dealing with, when you get to the end, you become a possessor of everything that belongs to you in Christ. And he says, we count them happy that endure. And my friends, 
Sometimes you have to endure to get to the blessing. What does the word endure mean? Well, you're going to find out it appears several times in these verses, so it's pretty important. The word endure is the Greek word hupomeno. Listen to this. It means to stay or to abide. We count them happy that stayed or abide. It means to remain in one spot. We count them happy that stayed in their spot. They refused to surrender. It means to keep a position. We count them happy that kept their position. It means to resolve, to maintain territory that has already been gained. So we count them happy that resolve they were going to maintain their territory. And in a military sense, this Greek word, hupomeno, pictures soldiers ordered to maintain their positions even in the face of opposition, to defiantly stick it out regardless of pressures mounted against it. One man calls it staying power. Another expositor calls it hang in their power. It is the attitude that holds out, holds on, outlasts, perseveres, hangs in there, never giving up, refusing to surrender to obstacles and turning down every opportunity to quit. It pictures one who is under a heavy load, doesn't deny the fact that the load is there, He's under a heavy load, but he refuses to bend, break, or surrender because he is convinced that the territory, promise, or principle under assault belongs rightly to him. Wow, that's what the word endure means. And it says, we count them happy that endure. And of course, you understand, they decided they're not going to bend. They're not going to break. They're going to go all the way to the end. And then he gives us an example in verse 11. You've heard of the patience of Job. Well, everybody's heard of Job. But it goes on to say, and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. But notice it says the patience of Job. You know, if you listen to most religious people, they think that Job was a man that was just the victim of his circumstances. He just lost everything. He was just the victim of everything that was happening to him. But hey, this verse gives us a new insight to the story of Job. It describes the patience of Job. That's not just waiting it out and waiting for everything to end. The word patience is the same word we just saw, which previously is translated as the word endure. The endurance of Job would be a far better translation. And because James repeats it immediately in the same verse, it must be important. So let's look at the meaning of this word patience, the Greek word hupomenate, one more time. It means to stay or to abide, to remain in one spot, to keep a position, to resolve to maintain territory gained. In a military sense, it pictures soldiers ordered to maintain their positions even in the face of opposition, to defiantly stick it out regardless of pressures mounted against it. This adds such a new flavor to the story of Job because most people think Job was just a man that was a victim of his circumstances. But here, James uses the word patience, which means Job internally had made a decision. I know my spot. I know where I am. I know what belongs to me. I'm going to defiantly stick it out. He had the attitude that he would not surrender. And it goes on to mean the attitude that holds out, holds on, outlasts, perseveres, and hangs in there, never giving up, refusing to surrender to obstacles and turning down every opportunity to quit. It pictures one under a heavy load, but refuses to bend, break, or surrender because he's convinced that the territory, promise, or principle under assault rightly belongs to him. And the very fact that James would use this word means Job was just not lingering and holding on. He was holding on, hanging in there, refusing to give up. And it goes on to say, and we have seen the end of the Lord. The word seen, the Greek word horeo, which means to see, to behold, to perceive, to comprehend by observation. How can you comprehend by observation the story of Job? By reading the book of Job. And it says the end of the Lord. The word end, the Greek word telos, the outcome, the conclusion, how it's all going to end, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. The word that in Greek is the word hoti. It's pointing to something very important. Here's the conclusion. The Lord is very 
pitiful. And here you have the most interesting word, the Greek word polusplognos. It's a compound of two words. The word polus describes something great in number or something that is plenteous. And the word splognos, which interestingly is the Greek word for the intestines or the bowels, but it's where we get the word compassion. When you put the two words together, it means the Lord internally is deeply moved. He's plenteous in mercy. He deeply feels. There's no limitation to what he feels for his people. And he is of tender mercy. The Greek word oiktirmos, which means when God sees his people in trouble, he doesn't abandon them. He has tender mercy. Oiktirmos describes a compassion that acts. God moves. God acts. And now James is reminding his readers and us, if you're struggling, never forget God will be deeply moved for you and he will act on your behalf. Wow. Then he says in verse 12, but above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any other oath, but let your yea be yea and your nay be nay, lest you fall into condemnation. Why does he say this? Well, let's begin at the first of verse 12, where he says, but, and the word but in Greek is the word day. It is an exclamation mark. It means categorically, emphatically above all things. And then he says again, my brethren, above all things in Greek says propanton, above all else, my brethren. Now this word brethren is used again. He's crawling into the trenches. He's speaking to them face to face, brother to brother. And he says, swear not. And the word swear is a Greek word, which means to swear, to make an oath, or even better, it pictures a rash or threatening oath, or it pictures one who is swearing that he is going to take matters into his own hands. This person is tired of the injustice that he's feeling, tired of waiting for things to turn around. And the temptation is to say, you know what? I'm just going to take matters into my own hand. And James says, don't do it. Don't do it above all else. The word but, the Greek word day, an exclamation mark categorically, emphatically, don't do this. He says, neither swear by heaven, neither by earth, neither by any other oath. The word neither in every case in this verse is the Greek word mete, which means neither, never, ever, Keep it beyond the realm of possibility. Don't even go there. Don't even go there. Don't swear by heaven. Don't even go there. Don't swear by the earth. Don't even go there. Just keep it out of the realm of possibility. Neither swear by any other oath. Any other oath in Greek means by any other pledge, oath, or threatening statement. And I have to tell you that this reminds me of the words of Jesus, who was the half-brother of James. They had the same mother, but they had different fathers. James' father was Joseph. Jesus' father was God. But in Matthew 5, verse 34, Jesus said, But I say, and you swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king, neither shalt thou swear by thy head because thou canst not make one hair white or black, verse 37, but let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay, for whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. It's evil. It's going to get you in trouble when you get into a threatening mode and decide you're going to take matters into your own hands and set things right by yourself. So now let's go back to James chapter 5, verse 12, where James continues. But above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by earth, neither by any other oath. Don't go there. Don't do it. Keep it beyond the realm of possibility. But let your yea be yea and your nay nay, lest you fall into condemnation. And when he says, but remarkably, it again is the Greek word day, which is an exclamation marker. It means categorically, emphatically, rather than make threats, he says emphatically, let your yea be yea, let your nay be nay. What does that mean? It means live simply and stay out of the retribution and vengeance business. Remember, the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 12, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And when you enter into the retribution 
and vengeance business. It's not yours. That is not your business. It clearly says in Romans 12, I will repay, says the Lord. Don't get into that business. And remember, the law of sowing and reaping, what you dole out to others is what's going to come back to you. And so James says, hey, keep it simple. Stay out of the retribution and vengeance business. Just let your yay be yay, your nay be nay. And then he adds, lest you fall into condemnation. Fall into condemnation. The word fall is a translation of the Greek word pipto. The word pipto is a well-established word used all over the New Testament. Here's what it means. It means to fall. It depicts a downward plummet. In other words, you're not just kind of following, you're plummeting downward. To fall into a terrible predicament or into a worse state than you were in before. Someone who falls into some type of failure. And now James warns us that when we get into a threatening mode and say we're going to take retribution and vengeance into our own hands and settle the score by ourselves, we're going to fall into a situation that is worse than the one that we're currently in. He says, don't do it. Don't go there. Keep it beyond the realm of possibility. He says, you will fall into condemnation. And the word into, it's really not a very good translation because it is a Greek word, hupo, which means under. You're going to fall under. You're going to fall under, he says, condemnation. And listen to the Greek word condemnation. It is literally pronounced crisis. And it is where we get the word for a crisis situation. It depicts judgment. It could be judgment passed on to you by others. It could be a self-inflicted judgment. And really, that's what he's talking about here. This will be a self-inflicted judgment. If you get into the flesh and try to solve everything by yourself and begin to make a bunch of threatening statements, I'm going to settle the score. You're going to have some self-inflicted problems in your life. It's where we get the word crisis. Hence, to fall into a crisis situation, and it pictures one who makes matters worse by himself and creates a worse crisis. Hence, it depicts self-inflicted troubles. So rather than say, I'm tired of this injustice and I'm going to settle the score and begin to make a bunch of threatening statements, it's better to consider the story of Job and the prophets of old, to study them, to see how they got through their hard times. And you will see in all of their cases, they had endurance. They kept their eyes fixed on the Lord and the Lord was filled with tender mercies and he acted on their behalf. And that's what the Lord will do with you too if you'll stay in faith and keep a right attitude. I'll be back in just a moment and I want to pray for you. Do you struggle to know the answers to basic questions that come up in life? In this five-part series, Getting the Basics Right, Rick Renner will share what you should do if you are financially not being compensated correctly, to keep yourself encouraged when you feel surrounded by discouragement, to live free from bitterness and stay out of the retribution and vengeance business, if you need to be anointed with oil because you're sick, to intercede for the deliverance of a friend or family member who has wandered spiritually. This series will equip you to get the basics right on vital, everyday issues and problems. Available in digital or physical formats, starting at just $10. This series contains essential information every believer should know. And today we're also offering you the book, Signs You'll See Just Before Jesus Comes. Scaring people with Bible prophecy should not be our goal. But God in His great love has chosen to inform us explicitly about the last days so that we can be prepared. In this book, Rick Renner gives the signs you'll see just before Jesus comes. You'll learn where we are on God's timetable, what specific signs we'll see to let us know we're coming to the end of the age, the final and ultimate sign that Jesus is about to come again, and so much more. This important and informative book can be yours for only $15. Don't delay ordering the five-part series, Getting the Basics Right, and the book, Signs You'll See Just Before Jesus Comes. Call the number on your screen now or go to renner.org to order. Call or go online now. Hey friends, this is Rick Renner, and right now I'm standing in what's going to be the future studio for our television ministry in Moscow, Russia. Who would have ever believed that we would be broadcasting the Word of God from Moscow 
to the ends of the earth, that that's exactly what's happening. Romans 10, 18 says their words will go into all the world, their voice to the ends of the earth, and it's really happening. And my friends, we're constructing the studio. Look at it. The walls are starting to go up. And within just two weeks, this entire building will be standing with the roof, the doors, the windows, everything. And then the work begins on the interior. And I get so excited thinking that right where I'm standing is where I'm going to be seated looking into the camera to teach the Word of God to people all over the world who are crying out and who are saying, God, please send us someone with teaching that we can trust. I believe that's our assignment. Proverbs 10, 21 says, the lips of the righteous feed many. And I know our job is to feed many the Word of God. And we do it because of the anointing and because of your help as partners. Thank you for being part of the giving team that's making this come to pass. And if you're not already a part of the giving team, please, would you pray about joining us to help us make this dream become a reality? We're off to a good start, but we need to finish and we need as many people as possible to participate. So I welcome you to our giving team and I thank you in advance for everything that you're going to do. Wow, today has been so rich and we're barely getting started. So tomorrow we're gonna to come back and continue in James chapter five and learn about the power of praying for one another. And by the way, if you need prayer right now, call us. We're waiting to pray for you. Just ring our phone or send us an email. And the moment we hear from you, we'll begin to pray with you for God to do something so wonderful in your life. But remember that we're offering you my brand new series, which is called Getting the Basics Right. Is this an amazing series? It's five parts. It comes in multiple formats. The subtitle says Biblical Guidelines for Money, relationships, prayer, and dealing with wayward believers, friends, or loved ones. And as I always tell you, it comes with a study guide because we want you to be able to read the material while you listen to it or while you see it. The Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The Greek actually says by hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing when you hear it and hear it and read it and read it, you really get the teaching down deep inside you. So please order yours today by going online or by giving us a call. And we're also offering you this week, my book called Signs You'll See Just Before Jesus Comes. People often say, are we really close to the coming of Jesus? Well, if you know the signs that Jesus gave us, you'll understand we're pretty close to the coming of Jesus. And this book, Signs You'll See Just Before Jesus Comes, will thrill your heart and just ignite your faith to believe we are on the precipice of the coming of the Lord. But you can order this also by going online or by giving us a call. But Father, we thank you that those who endure to the end are the ones that are supremely blessed. Help us to grab hold of the power of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God and endure to the end and push through every obstacle. In Jesus' name, amen. I'll see you tomorrow. But remember Ecclesiastes 8.4, where the word of a king is, there really is power. Power.